our bread and butter, really, in the magazine is artist profiles. And we run at least a half a dozen in every issue. Um, a little while back, a couple years ago, we ran a, a big story on Michael Strand uh, and his social practice as a potter. Uh, we ran a profile of Abir Ali and Andre Sandifer, who are Detroit furniture makers. There's hometown Asheville girl Lisa Klukulik, which is here tonight. I think that was, what, two or three years ago? Something like that? Uh, more recently, in our Nature issue, which was April-May, we ran a story about Mariko Kuzumoto, who used to make these really intricate metal sculptures, kinetic sculptures, and now works in fiber. And her shift of mediums was a big part of the story. We do not confine ourselves to the traditional five craft mediums, to glass, ceramics, metal, fiber, and wood. Um, in part, we don't do that because we know we have readers who don't know there are five traditional craft mediums. And we know we have ones that don't necessarily care. Um, they're just interested in people who are making things. So we did a story, this is pretty typical, we did a story a while back on um, Jason Hackenworth, whose medium is balloons. We do our share of stories, uh, stories on m masters. Uh, here's a profile of uh, Lino Talia Pietra, who um, at age 80 is still innovating and is, of course, often called the world's greatest glassblower. And in all of these stories, um, especially the profiles, we're aiming for a mix of stories. We're aiming for a mix of mediums, because we cover the gamut, uh, levels of experience. We always include an emerging artist, uh, demographics, and locales. We don't want to have a magazine that's all ceramics or all fiber. We don't want to have an issue that um, is all white people. Uh, we don't want to have st all the stories be from New York or L.A., so we really try to go for a balance. And here's a good example of that. This is um, page two of our table of contents. I guess it's kind of hard to read, but top, um, as you see it, top left, uh, is a story about kind of an old school studio craft collector named Forrest Merrill, who's in the San Francisco Bay area, contributes a lot to exhibitions all over the country and has done it for years. Um, Next, we had a story about the ACC's Emerging Artist Awards, and this was five artists and a scholar, and these people lived all over the country, so they sort of added to our mix, and all, all relatively young people. Um, next, we had a story about 34-year-old ceramist Linda Lopez, who lives in Arkansas. Uh, we had our Lino Talia Pietra story, Lino uh, splits his time between Seattle and Murano, Italy. And then finally, we had a story about established quilter Paula Kavarik, who lives in Memphis. So for us, this is a pretty good mix. This is what we're going for. So the question of the evening, how do we decide who to cover? Going for a mix, trying to be accessible, but how do we decide who in the end we cover? Well, I have some ideas um, about, you know, for artists about how they can be covered or how they can get attention, how they can raise their profiles. And this is because we, every two months we do this scramble to try to find new content for the next issue. And so we do a ton of research and we're trying to track down artists and so on. So I want to sort of give you the benefit of my wisdom on that. My first piece of advice for somebody who wants to have coverage by American Craft or any other magazine is make distinctive work. Uh, make sure your voice is loud and clear and individual, in creatively speaking. We discovered emerging artist Jennifer Merchant, whose work this is, 
in 2012, and we were intrigued by what she was doing with acrylic and magazine pages. We hadn't seen jewelry like this before, and jewelry is a crowded field. Joe Pintz um, works with clay made for bricks, which lends a real weight to his work and a sort of Flintstone primitive quality that's really appealing and unusual. Michael Janis paints with tiny beads of powdered glass in ways that are really subtle and compelling and unusual. And from our latest issue, uh, we, we did a story on Colette Fu, uh, who's a documentary photographer of all people, who shoots a lot in uh, China, shoots among minority populations in China, and makes pop-up books out of her photography. Her work is unique. So that's a big way to come to people's attention is to have distinctive work. Another piece of advice, keep your website up to date. Um, Linda Lopez's website helped convince us to do a story on her because she had 2015 work on it. She has these um, consistently formatted captions. So as an editor, you can do your fact checking right from her website, which is great. Um, I know that some artists would rather be making work than making sure their website is up to date. And I understand that impulse. But it's important, if you want coverage, to have an up-to-date website. Um, it's disappointing, as an editor, to see a piece of work or get a sense of someone's practice and try to track it down, and maybe you find out what you've seen comes from 2008, and apparently they haven't done anything since. And maybe they've done a lot, they just haven't put it on a website. Um, once in a blue moon, if I'm really intrigued by an artist, I, and, and if their email address is available, which is another big if I'll get to in a minute, I will write to them and say, I'm interested in your work. Can you give me a sense of what you've done lately? Can you send me some pictures? But you can't count on that from editors because I'm busy from morning to night and beyond. Um, and there's a nice pool of artists who do have recent work on their websites and it's awfully tempting to sort of go to them and look past the others, if that makes sense. Peter Pincus is an artist who keeps his website up to date. He's continually replenishing it. And you get a sense right from the outset um, of how his work is organized on his website. It's, it's broken down into current, postgraduate, graduate, and archives, which is terrific. Along with having an up-to-date website, I would encourage artists to share recent work on social media. I tend to look for a website first. I know other editors who look at social media first. It never hurts to be in both places. Adam Field is a really smart um, ceramist in that, uh, if you can see along the bottom there, he's got these links. He's got a link not only, he's got a link to Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube right on his homepage. So you know immediately how to find out what he's doing. And if you go to his Instagram feed, you see thoughtful photography, you see videos of his process, you see his participation in, in social media campaigns like Ayumi Horie's um, Pots in Action campaign. You get a real sense of who this guy is. Field is the um, originator of something called Hide and Sika, which is a social media-based scavenger hunt that happens at NSICA conferences. So he's really out there in the world, putting himself out, making a name for himself. Deb Schwarzkopf is somebody who will tell you she was reluctant to be on social media in the beginning. She felt like she didn't have time. 
And now it's really part of her practice. She gets feedback from people. She, the give and take between her audience and herself is something that really fuels her. The top left photos you see there are before and after views of her kiln yard, which she raised money for on Kickstarter. So she's a real convert. Wherever you do it, whether it's on social media or on your website, we want you to tell us your story. Editors really want to know the basics. Where are you from? What are you doing? How did you get there? Tell us about your training. Tell us why you make. We want to get a sense of who you are as a person, concisely and directly, as, as, as uh, easily as possible. Shaniqua Brooks um, is sort of a poster child for doing this well. Uh, she not only has an artist statement on her website, which is great, and I know a lot of artists slave over their artist statements, but she's got a bio, which editors want to see right away, and she's also got that charming picture. So we were able to sort of get the complete Shaniqua Brooks story right from her website, and that helped us determine that we wanted to do a story on her. And by the way, she's only like 22. She's an emerging artist. Um, she's really got her act together. Uh, Roland and Shinami Ricketts have sort of a complicated story. Um, he dyes fabrics uh, with indigo. She's a weaver, and together they have an indigo farm. So this is kind of complicated, more complicated than one artist, one craft. Um, but they explain all of this on their homepage in a really concise, uh, easy-to-understand paragraph. And if you click on any of those three images, you go to more information about him, about her, and about the farm. And then, again, you're just going another deep level deeper, another level deeper. And so if you, you can see with the, at the, with the um, Roland subsection, there's a whole other tier of things so that you can find out more about him. Sometimes people ask, should I put my resume on my website? And I would say, yes, please. It really helps us get to know you, get to know what your training has been, where you've come from, uh, gives us a sense of your path and helps us envision a bigger story. Roland Ricketts not only has this simple resume right on his website, he has a more detailed one in PDF form that you can download, which is terrific. Our writer um, was able to read the Ricketts' website, read the resumes, get a real sense for these people before she ever did an interview. And so she was able to skip the superficialities and go deep in the interview, which is just what you want, just how you uh, create a good story. Here's another thing, and you would think, I would think it would be sort of elementary, but it's not. Tell us how to reach you. Sometimes it's almost impossible to tell from someone's website. Um, furniture maker Annie Evelyn is great because she not only gave us her uh, email address, she tells us her street address. She's in Brooklyn, which is great. Again, we're trying to figure out the mix. In some cases, we're trying to figure out, do we have a photographer nearby? So we want to know, where do you live? And sometimes it's nearly impossible to find out from someone's website. I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but artists seem to really like these contact boxes. I don't know any editors who like them. <laughs> um, it feels like when you fill one of these out, you are sending a message into the ether. Sometimes I hear back, sometimes I don't. Um, the other day, I needed to get in touch with an artist um, because I wanted to use a picture or two of his work with a story, story we were running about an unusual medium. And I only had a contact box and no email, no phone, no nothing. Um, and the contact message part only allowed 125 characters. So it was like more limiting than a tweet. So my message to him sounded like a ransom note or something or a <laughs> telegram. I mean, it was... Please help, need images, American craft, act fast, high resolution. It was, it was crazy. 
No wonder I didn't hear back. You probably thought I was nuts. Um, but these contact boxes can be sort of a pain. Here's another piece of advice. Start a blog, but only if you can keep it up. Paula Kavarik is a great example of somebody who has a blog that she says really feeds her practice and really helps her process her ideas and also tells the world who she is and what she's doing. You can see right on her homepage there's a button that says My Journal, and that's her blog, and you press on that, and you get this page that shows um, the latest blog, which was late June, and I think she's actually posted since I did this screenshot. Um, but she's posting every week or 10 days or so, which is great. Across the top are um, links to other blog posts, and if you go to one of those, you get a work in progress. You get a quilt in progress. And she's looking for feedback, and she's sort of talking about what she's thinking about doing with this quilt. Paula Kavarik is interesting in that um, she not only shares her successes, she shares her stumbles. And as we spent time on her website, we became more and more impressed with her as a person. I mean, she's just very down to earth. She's willing to be a little vulnerable. And all of that really gave us a sense of how she would come across in a story, what she would sound like, what her quotes might be like, and really sort of tipped the scales for us. Here's a tricky question. Sometimes uh, artists ask me, can I contact you? Can I pitch myself to you? And certainly some artists do. Um, this is not my favorite way to be approached, to be honest with you. Um, will you please take the time to view my current still unfinished website? And I've gotten this note, essentially this same note, about three times from, from this guy. And the third time I thought, will you please take time to finish your website and then contact me? That would be a good idea. Um, as a person who gets hundreds of emails every week, my email is totally out of control. It's like a fire hose. I hate to say, <laughs> yes, you can contact me. But there are times when it's really a good idea to get in touch with an editor. What are those times? Milestones are a good time. If you're reaching some kind of milestone, if your work is going to be in a show, if you're doing some kind of social practice or performance or what have you, if you're, you know, that's coming to fruition for you. If you're graduating, it can be hard to find emerging artists. So if you're getting your BFA and you've got work to show, you're getting your MFA and you've got work to show, and not two or three pieces or two or three examples, 10 would be nice. Um, if you're newly represented by a gallery, if you just got a grant or a residency or some other kind of honor, Maybe you're winding up a new body of work, or you're joining a collective. That's how we found these guys, the Wax Surf Company. They're custom surfboard builders out of Brooklyn, of all places. Um, they announced their affiliation with an online shop called Fier Fiercely Made, and we got wind of it, and we thought we've always wanted to cover some people who make surfboards, so let's do this. If you're going to get in touch with an editor, I would encourage you to observe good email etiquette. Um, keep your note direct and brief. I always think it's a good idea to personalize the subject line. If you send me a note that says this, where the subject line says ceramics in the 21st century, I may blow right past that. I may think that's a mass email and not even open it or take weeks to open it. Hi, Monica, new body of work. That's probably going to get my attention. Um, what you don't want to do is, an, is approach an editor um, saying something like, I want to write a 5,000-word first-person story for the magazine. This has happened. <laughs> What's wrong with that? We don't do 5,000-word first-person stories. So whatever magazine you're approaching, you should know enough about um, to know where you might fit. 
We've had a couple of artists do really smart things and view approaching us as this like long-term thing, as like relationship building, which I really appreciate. Um, they might offer to help in some way. They might suggest a show that we should preview. We preview a dozen or so exhibitions in every issue. Or maybe they offer to write like a brief blog post for our website or something. It's, maybe it's about their work, maybe it's about somebody else's work, who knows. But those are ways you can be helpful and start to sort of get your toe in the door. And then finally, I would encourage artists who would love to be covered to be patient because we are slow. Um, we tend to work four to six months in advance. Right now we are finishing up October, November and planning December, January. And even if we have our eyes on an artist and we really want to cover that person, it may be months or even years, frankly, before we get to it. We may be waiting for the right issue theme, we may be waiting for the right milestone, the right moment. A lot of factors come into play. Maybe the mix isn't right. Um, the other day, an artist wrote to us and said, I've got a new body of work, and it's based on a sense of place. And the senior editor and I looked at each other, and we looked at the work, which was good, and we said, we've got to keep an eye on this guy. Because we have an issue coming up that's based on sense of place, and he'd be perfect. But are we going to contact him tomorrow? No, it's probably going to be months. It's going to be next year sometime. So patience, definitely, in dealing with magazines is a virtue. So my message is, if you're strategic and you're patient uh, and your work is distinctive and you're evolving as an artist, those are all interesting things and you can get attention. And I wish you all the best in your efforts to do that.